Good morning. Welcome to Monday Manna. This is Gwen Molietta proclaiming his word ministry. And I'm so glad that you're going to uh, tune in today to this teaching. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the New Testament book of Luke, chapter 15. But before I pray and minister the word of God, I just want to invite you all to an event at my church in uh, Pleasantville, New Jersey. It's called Crossroads Fellowship. I do these summer meetings called Morning Glory Meetings, and the next one is August the 28th. It's called The Manifestation of Intercession, and uh, everyone is invited. It's 10 to 12 noon, no uh, financial uh, commitment. It's just free. It, there's a free will offering because of a worship leader and things that expenses, but it's free. So it is August the 28th. 10 to 12. If you would like some brochures or flyers, uh, my website will be announced at the end of this uh, Monday Manning, Monday Manning teaching, and you can let us know, email us, or give my office a call, and we can get some cards out to you. So again, August 28th, 10 a.m., Pleasantville, New Jersey, the Manifestation of Intercession. And so we're going to pray now and be in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Father, I thank you this morning for the Holy Spirit. I thank you that he leads us into all the truth. I thank you that he helps us discern between truth and error. And this morning, Lord, I ask that you would open our hearts and our minds and our souls to realize that you're speaking to each and every one of us. Lord, this is a very familiar parable of the prodigal son. But God, I'm more concerned about those of us that have to watch out for being the elder brother. And so I just uh, thank you, Holy Spirit, now for anointing me afresh and anew and speaking through me to every person that will receive this teaching. Thank you, God, that your word is powerful and you watch over it to perform it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the title of the message today is, Are You an Elder Brother? Or, you know, boring, we could call it My Two Sons. But I want to read uh, the story in Luke 15 about the parable, uh, the parable of the prodigal son. Everybody seems to preach on the prodigal. I'm more concerned in this story about the elder brother. And so if you're taking notes, I'm going to list six things that all start with the letter R. Bible teachers like to make it real easy for you. So they're all going to start with the letter R and there'll be six of them. And so I'm, what I'm going to do is just go through the story verse by verse, making comments on the six points that start with the letter R. Then we'll get to the meat of the message, uh, which is found towards the end of the chapter. And so I am in Luke 15 and I'm going to start reading at verse 11. And I'm going to read maybe 11 through 16, and we'll talk about these different segments in this story. Luke 11, verse, Luke, I'm sorry, I'm done making mistakes now. Luke 15, verse 11. And Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me and divide them among the living. Now, this is just commentary here. I'll let you know when I get to my first R. But how, I could use the word rude if I wanted to make seven of them. How rude is this young man to go to his father and ask for the inheritance before his father even dies? How many of you know that when we die, our goods are left to our children, our family, we have a will, many of us. He's not even waiting for his dad to kick the bucket. He wants his goods right now. So he goes to his father and he says, dad, divide the spoil. I want my share now. I don't want to wait till you die, which I think is rather rude, but that's not one of my six R's but it could be. Um, so he said, give me what's mine now, Dad. I don't want to wait till you die. Verse 13. And not many days after the younger son, oh, he divided them all of his living. Okay, so let me do 12 again because I get, I get on little rabbit trails. Verse 12. The younger of them came and said, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me and divide, and he divided unto them, both sons, his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and there he wasted the substance with riotous living. Um, the word riotous in the King James mean to be, means to be wild and loose. So where I live near Atlantic City, he went to the casinos and he gambled and overindulged in many things. Verse 14, and when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land and he began to be in want. He went and joined himself to a citizen of the country, 
uh, and he sent him into the into the fields to feed the swine. Now, again, remember, this is Jesus telling this parable to Jewish people who wouldn't have anything to do with swines and pigs. Uh, remember when Jesus cast out the devils, they went into the pigs and the swine and they all ran over the cliff. They committed suicide. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't help myself. So pigs were unclean, unholy, and the Jewish people were appalled now that he would tell this parable of these two sons, and one would go live among the pigs and feed the swine. Verse 16, and he would have fainted and filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Verse 17, and when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father have bread enough to spare, and I perish here with hunger? Verse 18, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee. So let's look at the first R. Obviously, the first R is verses 12 to 16, and it's rebellion. This young man is totally rebellious. He goes to his father, he gets all of the inheritance, and he squanders it with wild living, ends up broke, busted, disgusted, has nothing left, and he is in complete and total rebellion. And even though I don't want to pause here, you know, many of us think we are not rebellious <laughs> until we don't get our own way. And then God help us. Uh, we know what it is to be rebellious. I remember real quick years ago, I was taking some of the women in my ministry on a little paid vacation that I was paying for. My ministry was paying for it. And there was, I don't know, four or five of them and just one of me. And everything I wanted to do, they didn't want to do. And so this was going on like all day. And by the time we got to the dinner, I was livid. I was so angry that I wasn't getting my own way. And I didn't realize what I was doing. And so they all wanted to go to, we were in Delaware. They all wanted to go to one of these crab houses where you have newspaper instead of linen and you have a mallet and you crack the crabs. And I wanted to go to fine dining and they wanted to go to a crab house. And uh, so they outvoted me again and we went to the crab house and I ordered a steak and a potato because I was so livid with them that I wasn't going to have any crab and I wasn't going to have any fun. And so I pretty much made everybody miserable. And at the end of the night, we came back to the little house we were staying in and I guess the five of them got together and came into my bedroom and said, will you just quit being so stubborn and rebellious? You're ruining this for everybody. Just because you don't have your way, this is how you act. Well, they said, grow up. One of them told me to get a life and they walked out of the bedroom. And I sat there like, how dare you? I'm paying for this. And I realized, thank you, Jesus, that it was just rebellion, that I was so used to having my own way because I was the boss the president, um, the CEO, that they had to put me in my place and how thankful I am to those women of God that set me straight that day. And the rest of the vacation was without incident. I became a team player, but I know what it is to be rebellious. And it shocked me that I, I had that much in me that I could be that rebellious just because I didn't get my way. I know you can't relate to that, but trust me, others can. So he's rebellious, wastes all his father's inheritance, waste everything his dad worked his whole life for. Um, that's pretty sad. And we've seen that, haven't we? When someone dies and the inheritance is given out and one kid or they'll just go and squander everything. How, how sad. Somebody works their whole life for this. But anyway, back to the parable. So he's rebellious. Number one, the first R verses 12 to 16, he's rebellious. The second R is verses 17 to 19. Thanks be to God, he comes into repentance. He says in verse 17, uh, verse 18, I'll arise and go to my father. I will say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against thee. He's got it in the right order. We sin against God first before we ever sin against other people. So he realizes he has to repent. Now remember that the word repentance means you're heading in one direction. You're aware that this is not the best thing or best choice or the healthiest decision. And you turn and go another direction. That's the word repentance. And godly repentance, the Bible says, leaves no sorrow and no regret. So he came to himself. And I pray that for the prodigals out there, our grandchildren, great-grandchildren, our children, that they come to their senses and come to themselves. Because the riotous living, the world, really doesn't have anything to offer us that brings us eternal joy and peace and satisfaction like Jesus does. So he comes to himself and he says, I've sinned against God first and my father. So we're reading verse 
um, 19. I'm no more worthy to be called a son. So he repents. Let me go back and do justice to this. Verse 18. I will arise and go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I sinned against heaven and before thee. I'm not even worthy to be called your son. Just make me as one of your hired servants. So he certainly repented. And he humbled himself. He, he's going to come back and say to this wealthy father, I'm only worthy to be a servant after what I've done. I've squandered your living. I've uh, sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. Please just receive me back, not necessarily as a son, but as a servant. So he has genuine repentance, which produces fruit. If somebody says they repent and they don't change their action and their behavior, nothing is different. They haven't really repented. So, you know, sometimes we or repent because we're sorry we got caught. We're not sorry for what we did. There's a big difference. Genuine repentance, you will change your, your behavior. So he repents. Now, let's look at the next R, verses 20 to 21. I want to talk about reconciliation. Verse 20 and 21. So he arose and came to his father. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. So I want to read 20 and 21. He has a reconciliation with his father. Now, what's so beautiful about this story? Sometimes you have to go back into Jewish culture and the history of the times. For this prodigal to be in the pig's sty and with pigs, he was now unclean. And, and because of his rebellion to come home, they could have easily stoned him. There's verses in the Old Testament that talks about the rebellious child, the stubborn child. Take him out into the square and stone him. If we did that, we wouldn't have to worry about population. Uh, we'd lose a lot of our children. But they had the right in the Bible to stone a rebellious, stubborn, sinful son. So when the father ran out to meet him, which was not the culture, the culture was that you honored the, the elder, you came to him. Um, but when the father ran to his son and put his arms around him and covered him, what he was doing is protecting him from being stoned and killed. The father covered his sin. Aren't we glad today that Jesus covers our sin? And when the Father sees us, he sees us in the robe of righteousness that Jesus covers us with. Because we deserve to be stoned for our rebellion and for our sin. But the Father covers us. So the Father runs out, wraps his arm around his son so they can't stone him. And he kisses him. He forgives him, obviously. Um, verse 20, he has compassion. He, he kisses him. And then um, in verse 21... All the way to 24, we have rejoicing. So let me just go over this quickly. Rebellion is verses 12 to 16. Repentance is verses 17 to 19. Reconciliation is verse 20 to 21. And verse 22 to 24, there's a great rejoicing. So let's look at what happens in verse 22. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Now, if I was taking the time to teach on the prodigal, each one of these are very important. The robe, uh, the shoes, the ring, they were all very significant. You can do your own Bible study on this, but it meant you were royalty and you were like second in command to have the robe and the ring like they gave Joseph when he became Pharaoh's right-hand man over all of Egypt. This was uh, reinstating him. And so he gets the ring and he gets the robe and, and uh, then they're going to have a big feast in verse 23. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's eat and be merry. So they're going to have a big barbecue. They're going to invite all their family and friends. Verse 24, for this, my son was dead, but he's alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. And they began to be merry. I want to read uh, 25 too under the rejoicing uh, because there's something funny in verse 25. And we're going to talk now about the elder son. Now the elder son was in the field. And when he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard the music and the dancing. I have to stop at verse 25. I heard a preacher one time uh, say that he was raised in a real strict Pentecostal home. And so there was no ing in his, in his life. He was not allowed any dancing, singing, partying, 
drinking, nothing with an ing. He couldn't even go bowling. Well, he really just made me laugh. I thought that's so funny. Nothing with an ing. No partying, no dancing, no drinking, no smoking. Um, and I remember many years ago when my daughter was going to get married, some of the uh, saints questioned, uh, should we have dancing at her wedding? And uh, I had to go to the Lord because I really wanted to have her dance with my husband, the father daughter dance like I did with my dad on my wedding day and God gave me this story and when I hit verse 25 and I saw that the father threw a party and the party involved music and dancing we certainly danced we had a wonderful wedding and we danced the night away nothing sinful nothing provocative wholesome healthy enjoyable dancing including the chicken dance <laughs> I'm sorry okay no dancing, no partying, no bowling, no kissing. Okay, so now the elder son comes and he hears the music and there's a party going on. So let's take a look at the elder brother. I'm going to read 25 all the way to 32 and then we'll go back and talk about him. Verse uh, 25, just one more time, be patient with me. Now the elder brother was in the field and when he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard the music and the dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked, what, what do these things mean? Verse 27. And he said, your brother is come. Your father has killed the fatted calf because he received him safe and sound. Verse 28. And he was angry and he would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answered and said to his father, lo, these many years do I serve you. And I have neither transgressed at any time any of your commandments. And yet you never gave me a kid. You never made merry with me and my friends. Verse 30. And as soon as this, thy son, he can't even call him his brother. It's not my brother, it's your son. As soon as this, thy son comes, which has devoured thy living with harlots, you kill for him the fatted calf. Verse 31. And he said, son, thou art, all we, thou art ever with me. All that I have is thine. It was meet that we should be merry and be glad for this, thy brother. Let's get it back. Not my son, your brother that thy brother was dead, he's alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. So let's take a look at the elder brother. A couple of things I noticed, and we're gonna talk about resentment now. We've taken care of all the rebellion, the repentance, the reconciliation, the rejoicing. Let's focus in on the resentment. The elder brother was resentful that the father gave his, his brother, uh, the squanderer, uh, uh, the young man who was not accountable for his behavior, squandered everything. This brother is resentful. He is angry and he won't even go into his father's house. He calls the servants. What's the party in? What's the music? I smell this roast. What's happening? Oh, your brother came back. And so the father went out to the elder brother. And I'm going to say something now that I think is incredibly powerful. And I trust it will minister to you. Uh, why didn't the father go after the prodigal son. He did not, you know. He waited for the prodigal to come to repentance and come home. He did not go out after the prodigal son. But he did go out after the elder son. If you look at verse, let me see if I can find it. Uh, verse 28. The father came out, verse 28, and entreated him. It means to call someone close to you, to aid them, to help them. Why wouldn't he go after the prodigal, but he went out for the elder and here's what I believe. You can't reason with a rebel. You can't reason with somebody who's in rebellion. But the elder brother was really the lost son in this story, not the first one. Because the first son came to repentance, came to reconciliation. The elder brother's lost. And God went out to the lost son. He might not have chased down the rebel, but he went out to the lost son. So why didn't he go after the first son? Because you can't reason with a rebel. But you can go out and seek the lost. And that's what Jesus came to do, to seek and to save those that were lost. So look at him. He's so resentful and filled with anger, he won't even go in. Uh, let me give you a couple verses on anger just uh, quickly. Ecclesiastes 7, 9. This is on him being so angry, which is found in verse, where is he angry? And he wouldn't go in. Verse 28. Ecclesiastes 7, 9 says, Be not hasty in your spirit to get angry, for anger rests in the bosom of a fool. So when we get angry, we are being very foolish. He was very foolish not to go in and celebrate his brother's return. But Proverbs 19, 11 in the Amplified, if you have an Amplified Bible, this is so good. Listen to this verse. Good sense 
and discretion makes a man slow to anger. It is his honor and glory to overlook a transgression or an offense without seeking revenge or harboring resentment. Let me do Proverbs 19.11 again in the Amplified because the elder brother is angry, resentful. Um, he is filled with resentment and, and probably a little bit of rage that his father, after giving his brother all his goods, would now spend more money on him. A robe, a ring, shoes, a party. Um, here's uh, Proverbs 19.11 in the Amplified. Good sense and discretion makes a man slow to anger. It is his honor and glory to overlook a transgression or an offense without seeking revenge and harboring resentment. So the elder brother is filled with resentment. Now we're going to see him restored to the father. But before I get there, I just want to take a minute. And then I'll show you some things about the older brother. My last uh, point with the R is um, restoration. He's going to be restored to the father, to the brother. Hopefully it doesn't say that, but I'm sure if he went in, he was restored. So all my R's are rebellion, repentance, reconciliation, rejoicing, resentment, and um, restoration. He's going to be restored to the father. Uh, let me read it again, and then I just want to talk for a minute. Verse 30. But he said, as soon as this thy son comes, which has devoured thy living with harlots, you killed for him the fatted calf. And he, the father, verse 31, said, son, you're ever with me. All I have is yours. It is meet or right that you should be merry and be glad for your brother was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. So that's restoration. Um, but I want to stop and take, I don't know, as long as I need to talk to you for a minute about the elder brother syndrome. Be careful. When you've been saved a long time, we start to get a little bit of self-righteousness and we think that we are, uh, you know, we know we're sanctified, we know we're justified, but we start to cop an attitude. And when we see these prodigals um, getting blessed of God, it's easy to get resentful. Uh, I know for me, and this was my biggest struggle, and so if you've heard my testimony before, maybe you can fast forward on YouTube uh, or Facebook, but I struggled terribly with cigarettes. When I got saved, I was smoking close to three packs a day. I had smoked for oh, years and years and years and years. And um, I didn't even bother with a lighter or matches because I just lit them end to end. And I remember going on different job interviews as a young woman and I would not take the job unless I could smoke at my desk because I was that addicted to Cools, which is a menthol cigarette. I did about three packs a day and I ate three packs of Hall's menthols every day. So I was doubly addicted to the cap nic nicotine. <laughs> I said caffeine. <laughs> yes, I'm addicted to caffeine. Don't pray for me. I don't want deliverance. Um, but after being saved a while, I started to get convicted that this had to go. I mean, I'd go to church and they'd sing and sing and preach and pray. And, and I just needed to smoke, man. My eyes were dilated. Uh, I was sweating. My hands were pulsing. The back of the hair on my neck was standing up. I needed a cigarette. And, uh, and I remember how hard it was for me to go 40 minutes or 45 minutes without a cigarette. It was torture. And uh, I remember one time I was out in my car. I had a little Carmen Ghia Volkswagen. I was out in the parking lot of the Methodist church and I figured I better double down. So I took two cigarettes and I lit them both and I smoked them together at the same time, trying to load my body with nicotine so I could make it through the church service. When I came in the back door, one of the, in the foyer, one of the greeters in the church hugged me. Her name was Terry. I've forgiven her. We became good friends. Terry hugged me and said to me, well, I'm sure glad you're not going to hell because you smell like you've been there. Really? <laughs> because I had smoke everywhere. Um, and so I struggled terribly. Now, here's the point about the elder brother. People were coming into the church and getting saved, going up to the altar. No big wailing of repentance. You know, I mean, they accepted Christ. They repented of their sin, but no outward beating of the chest, tearing of the clothes, wearing sackcloth, none of that. And they'd come back and say, well, the Lord just delivered me from smoking. I'm like, what? I remember taking my dad to a full gospel businessmen's dinner. And there was a couple hundred people there. And my dad went up for prayer <coughs> for something else. And the man prayed for my father. And this is way back. He died in 79. So this is in the uh, mid 70s. And my father got slain. And I knew that day, oh, it's real. My dad would never drop out or fall out or lay on the floor. Um, my dad gets up from the floor, 
comes back in front of all my friends and peers at the Full Gospel Businessmen's Dinner, takes his cigarettes out of his pocket, hands it to me and said, I'm delivered. I'll never smoke again. You can have them. Well, I smoked them and then I got some more of my own. So moving to the elder brother, I'm watching all these young Christians get set free immediately. I'm struggling. I mean, praying, crying out to God, trying to quit. Three years I struggled with this. Um, even after being spirit filled, I had trouble. I just couldn't break the addiction and I became the elder brother. I started to really resent all these young kids coming in, praying a single prayer and they were delivered. No more drugs, no more smoking, no more addictions. And I became the elder brother on the outside. And let me tell you the problem with the elder brother. I want to share with you what the elder brother lost. Number one, he lost, he couldn't even go into the father's house. Here's what he lost. He lost the father's heart that God loves us. And if God wants to set somebody free immediately and somebody else, it takes a few years, as long as we get free, it doesn't really matter. I did get my deliverance. I did get uh, completely set free of smoking, but I, for a season, was an elder brother. I resented how quickly everybody else was getting a touch from God, and I was not. He lost the father's heart. Number two, he lost forgiveness. He lost the value of forgiving his brother, receiving the forgiveness in the family. He lost quite a bit, the elder brother. He lost the father's heart. He lost forgiveness. He lost fellowship in the family. Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. Excuse me. He lost fellowship. He's outside the house. And then worst of all, he lost the father's presence. And that's what resentment will do to you and anger. We lose the heart of the father. We lose forgiveness. We lose fellowship. But worse, and of, of it all, we lose the Father's presence. Now, before I close this, and I did, I told you I got delivered, I want to take a look just at something really important in this story. And I have to turn to, let me give you two verses if you want to write them down. John 1, 12, and then I want to read 1 John 3, 1 and 2. Uh, John 1, 12. And then I have to find First John. Just give me one second here. Because uh, there's something in the story that the Lord really highlighted for me. If you will look back at the prodigal story or the elder brother, both of them saw themselves as servants. Neither one of them saw themselves as sons. They both saw themselves as servants. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the verses written down now, but you can read back through the story in Luke 15 and find it. They both said, the, the prodigal said, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. Just make me as one of your servants. And the elder brother came in and said, haven't I served you all these years? And yet you never had a party for me. So they both saw themselves as servants, but God saw them as sons. And so I want to read John 1, 12. It says, and he came, Jesus, to his own. But as many as receive him, to them he gives the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. We are now sons of God. Yes, we want to serve the Lord. Yes, we want to serve each other. But we have access to the Father's heart, the Father's house, the Father's fellowship, because we are not just servants. We are sons of God. John 1, 12. And I want to read 1 John 3, 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love it is. That the Father would bestow on us, that we would be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world doesn't know us because it doesn't know him. But we are now, beloved, the sons of God. So, yes, we want to serve the Lord. But he sees us as sons. And listen, sons have privileges. Sons have rights. Um, if you were a prodigal, take a moment and thank God that you're no longer lost, that you are found. I was, for sure, a prodigal out in the world before Jesus I always say Jesus found me, but how many of you know he was never lost? <laughs> I, or I found the Lord is what people say. I found the Lord. Well, he was never lost. But Jesus, I got saved when I was 27 years old. And up until that time, I'm going to tell you something. I had a serious problem with alcoholism. I was filled with anger, resentment, rage. I was worse than the elder brother. And I'm so glad today to know that I am saved, that the father came out after me. How about you? That all the other prodigals might have to wake up and come to themselves, which we did. But then we are restored to the Father, to the Father's house, to fellowship. So let me pray. Lord, I thank you for this teaching. And Father, I pray for us that you would forgive us, those of us that would be honest enough to say, there's times I'm an elder brother. 
there's a time I resent what you do for other people and how long it takes me to get what I need. Forgive us, Lord. We don't want to lose the Father's heart. We don't want to lose fellowship. We don't want to lose the Father's presence. And we certainly don't want to lose the significance and the power of having our sins forgiven. Thank you that you've taken each of us from the pigsty of life and set us at a banquet table with your son. We are here to serve you. But thank you that you've given us the power to become the very sons of God. We thank you. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Don't forget, please, to try to participate August 28th. Uh, have a blessed day, and uh, it was wonderful to minister to you. Thanks for tuning in.